Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, what's going on, everybody? You got Tommy and Randy here. Uh, today, we're doing a study on 1 John 5, 7, which uh, tends to be the most used verse for Trinitarians to try to prove the Trinity. So we're going to go over a study that goes really in-depth of this verse, and it, it goes through a lot of John, a lot of a lot of his epistle, his, his, his gospel, and it shows what he was trying to say in his writings and then how this verse, if you take it in the Trinitarian point of view, just contradicts all of his writings. So uh, we're going to start off, and and uh, this is called, These Three Are One, and inside it says, One What? A close examination of 1 John 5, 7 and 1 John 5, 8 from a biblical and historical record. What is the text saying, and what is the text not saying? So 1 John 5, 7 and 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. These texts are best understood when the reader has a better understanding of the context. However, practically, no one is led to study the whole testimony of Christ, let alone read the entire chapter of 1 John 5. Let's investigate some of Christ's record given. We will start by examining John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come or whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am my Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. This portion of John chapter 8 sets up the context and understanding of 1 John 5. We can see the Father and the Son bear witness or record, but we will see going forward that the Father is especially bearing witness of his Son, and Jesus testifies of this. Additionally, we see in the chapter of John chapter 5, verse 30 through 38, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of my Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. In verse 32 it says, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. Verse 33, Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto truth. But I received not the testimony from man, but the things I say, that you might be saved. Verse 35. He was a burning and shining light, and yet we were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that for John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. Beareth witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Verse 33. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him you believe not. So here we see that the Father is bearing witness of his Son that he had sent. Now we will enter into 1 John 5. But start by reading verse 9 and read to verse 20. We're going to do that. 1 John 5, 9 through 20. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath witness in himself. 
He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he hath not the Son of God had not life. These things I have written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and it shall be given him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say what he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, that he hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is true God and eternal life. Him that is true is God the Father. And eternal life originates from him, and is then given to his Son for us to have if we choose to have it. But if we have a false understanding of him through scripture. The context here so far is that God has given us a record, a witness that he hath given us his son, and through his son is eternal life. If you don't have the real begotten son of God, not a metaphor as many theologians now are teaching, then there is no chance for eternal life. Pay close attention to this. First John chapter 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not... God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Here in verse 10, the title God is used and refers to the Father. God is never used in Scripture to refer to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The record being shown here is that God gave his Son. Not God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gave their Son. God is the Father, and that is part of the context in 1 John chapter 5. Now read 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-5. through 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world." And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So we know, Tommy, that the Trinity, uh, the Trinity or Tritheism denies that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Yes. Okay, there's something of great significance to ponder on is found in the next verse. That's 1 John 5, 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ not by water alone, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Okay, so the human body is made up of water and blood. But let's look at who this is identifying in a special way when he says, he that came by water and blood. This is the part of the testimony or record. The water represents Jesus' baptism. I'm sure we'd all agree with that. And at that time, God anointed Jesus with his spirit. In Matthew 3, 16, it says, The Spirit of God descended like a dove and lighting upon him. The blood represents the crucifixion, death, and sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. So far, we see that the Father bears record or witness of his Son over and over. So when it comes to the Spirit mentioned in verse 6, why would it be any different? Is God the Father a spirit being? Why, yes. Nowhere else in the scripture would come up with the idea that the spirit could be anyone else without adding to the Bible or the scripture. Unless we were to mystify God and add additional personality or personhood to this Godhead. 
the spirit of truth, John chapter 4, verse 23, verse 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. God is a spirit. Let me repeat that again. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says, The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. You have a spirit, Tommy. Did you know that? Yes. So his spirit beareth witness with our spirit. Yes. That we are what? The children of God. The context of the spirit in Romans 8 16 is the father's spirit the Spirit of God. So why is this so hard to understand, Tommy? Because I believe we have a serpent theology being whispered in our ears in the very church buildings that we go in to trust for wisdom, learning, and understanding. In other words, they're preaching another Jesus. By the way, did you know there's two Jesuses in the Bible? Yes. You know, there's one that's true and there's one that's false. We see all through what we have viewed so far, it is all about the Father bearing witness of his Son. The Son is a reflection of the Father, His express image. There is no one else involved. Why would that change all of a sudden? It doesn't. When we think about the centurion piercing the side of Christ as he was dying on the cross, water and blood spilled out of Christ upon the spearing. The Spirit, His breath, mind, and personality, had left its life in the body of the Son of Man, who was also the Son of God. John chapter 19, verses 34 through 37 says, But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Now let's read verses 7 through 8. You should have a completely different outlook on these verses by examining the whole chapter more fully. The entire chapter is about witnessing that Jesus is truly the Son of God, and the Father bears that as a witness. Six times in this chapter alone, we are told that Jesus is the Son of God. So by the time we come to the troubled verses of 7 and 8, we will now see in the light that the Bible gives us not in the dribble of learned men from the universities, while there is a deep historical record of an issue with the authenticity of verses of 7 and 8, as far as their completeness as they were printed in the King James Bible, we will first address it as if they are authentic and nothing is wrong. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This verse does not say that these three are one God. The title God is missing completely. It is not teaching us that God is a community of three persons or that God is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Many try and approach this verse as support for a Trinity doctrine, but if you approach the word Trinity, the word itself only represents a number, the number of three. If you try and apply it to the scripture, then three what? The chapter doesn't tell us. It doesn't apply here. And the chapter doesn't support a Trinity doctrine either. Not even close. Amazing. So there are three that bear record in heaven, and they are one in record that they bear. In other testimony or references, we have seen it referred to as bearing witness. So what is this record? Let's look at it. The record. The Father bears record that God the Father gave his Son and gave us eternal life, which is in his Son. The Word bears record that God the Father gave His Son and gave us eternal life, which is in His Son. The Holy Spirit bears record that God the Father gave His Son and gave us eternal life, which is in His Son. The Father is the supreme being of the universe. If we look upon the Greek for the Word in this scripture, Strong's Concordance G 3056 states, Logos, a word as embodying an idea, a statement, or speech. Definition of word, uh, an embodying an idea, a statement, or speech, a word, speech, divine utterance, analogy. 
The word is commonly used to express the logos or Jesus. Now here we go in John 1.1. 1, 1. But in the context of this passage, when understanding all else that has taken place in the witness and record that is being given, what the Greek says and how it's interpreted needs to be considered. Additionally, Strong says 3056 logos from uh, 3004 lego, speaking to a conclusion, a word being the expression of a thought or a saying, that's 3056. Logos word is preeminently used of Christ, John 1.1, 1, 1, expressing the thoughts of the Father through the Spirit. And 356 logos is a common term used 330 times in the New Testament with regards to a person sharing a message, a discourse, or communication of speech. Logos is a broad term meaning reasoning expressed by words. Would you say we're doing <clears throat> logos right now, Tommy? Yes. And Thayer's Greek lexicon does not differ in this. And the Greek word there from Homer down uh, properly a collecting collection, and that is as well of those things which are put together in thought as of those which, having been thought, gathered together in the mind, are expressed in words. Accordingly, a twofold use of the term is to be distinguished, one which relates to speaking and one which relates to thinking. So here is the physical commands or voice of God. In other words, his speech or even his message. And this is recognized at the baptism of Christ when we read in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How else could God bear record other than by his mouth, his voice, and spirit omnipresence being sent? And when it comes to the Holy Ghost, or preferably the Holy Spirit, it is the Father's own spirit as the Spirit of God. It is the Father that is bearing witness in all of these things about his Son no one or nothing else. We have seen where the Father is a spirit. How about holy? There are 32 scriptures to be considered in the King James that tell us the Father is holy or has a holy name, but his identity is not God, the Holy Spirit. However, this ID has been added to make up many of today's Trinity doctrine creeds as a third divine being that is not the Father or Son. Here are just a few scriptures to consider in regard to the Father as holy. Psalms chapter 99 verse 5. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy. Isaiah 5.16 says, But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Hosea 11.9 I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim for I am God and not man the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Getting back to our three that bear record. All three bear record that God is a Father, not a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. First hmm. John 5 is telling us that God is a Father alone and that God gave his son. Verse 7 is all about the Father. And when we understand verse 8, it is all about the Son of God. Read and study all of this until this sinks in. A third of something or someone else does not fit the chapter or topic at all. Very bad theological exposition if your pastors are teaching that. Yes. Terrible. Yes. You're destroying, you're twisting scripture to your own destruction. Look at the totality of everything. In other words, the context. Everything is about the Father and the Son. In verse 8, it says that there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. It would have been better if this verse was printed as on earth all through the life of Christ while he was on earth. We have the testimony that he gave. If you read the scripture as it is plainly laid out without having colored fraud head or trinity lenses to look through, you will see the witness of Jesus in these verses that these three testimonies agree as one. First, the water, the baptism of Jesus. God anointed Jesus with his spirit, not another spirit, Tommy. The blood equals the crucifixion, death, sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. 
the Spirit, the resurrection of Jesus, the new life, or eternal life. They agree as one, and they are in harmony with everything that God has laid out for us, which is the plan of salvation, which is the everlasting gospel, right? Yes. Tommy, there's two different gospels being preached today, isn't there, Tommy? Yes. There's one that's true, and there's one that's false. There's a true Jesus and a false Jesus. So, through his Son, Jesus Christ, it is important to understand that Christ's identity as the Son of God. This is what John is telling us and reinforcing over and over. But he is also telling us the identity of God. Since Christ is the Son of God, this would identify God as our Father. And that is who God is here in this context in all of these passages. These three bear record that our God is a Father. Again, these verses cannot be repeated enough until it sinks into us. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And who is 1 John chapter 5 all about? In 1 John chapter 1 verse 3, This which I have seen and, and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and that truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The verse above reinforces that there is a specific relationship, and it involves a Father and a Son. Is this role-playing? No, this is real and literal. It says that our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. No one else is mentioned here, just two, not three. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. This is how God manifested his love. God is love. He did this by giving up his only begotten Son. This is how he has shown us his love. By receiving God's love, it draws us to make a change to our character. Love is what draws us to repentance. By holding on to his love, we become changed into the image of him. 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So the Trinity, Tommy, I don't want to interrupt, but the Trinity denies that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Yeah, and another thing I want to point out, it says in verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Mm -hmm. So if we dwell in God, does that mean that Tommy, the Spirit, is dwelling in God, a second person? It makes no sense. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. Confessions of Jesus being the Son of God is important. Also refer in the following scripture text as God the Father bore witness of his Son. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You know, Tommy, doesn't God know who his Son is, but yet pastors today don't know who the Son of God is? Yes. <laughs> Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Remember, we must be born again, Tommy, of the mm -hmm. Spirit. Everyone that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. So Christ is born of him or begotten. The Father is the begetter. Christ is begotten of him. This theme is what we find summarized in John's gospel. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 31. In other words, we need to find out, Tommy, what John is saying, mm -hmm. right? Yep. In John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Yes. What's he trying to tell us, you know? John chapter 20, verse 31 says, But these are written that ye might believe, or you and me might believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Why didn't he put God the Son there, Tommy? Yeah, because he didn't believe He that. didn't believe in a trinity. No. No. And that believing you might have life through his name. He knew who the Father and the Son was, didn't he? John knew. Yes. And John was wrote the book, or 
through an angel the book of what? Revel Revelation. Revelation. And who's the revelation of? Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. So this is important to all of our salvations, our, our eternal life. This is not a side issue. Oh, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe, and we'll just... No, this is not a side issue. You're being deceived. This is the main, this is the main course right here. The question comes down to, is God three co-eternal, co-equal beings, or is God a loving father who beget a son who had to sacrifice his son in order to save us? Which, yes. Did God the Father give Christ equality or equal? Yes, he did. Or did his son possess it of himself totally on his own? No, it had to be given him. So John chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. Is this an act performed by three co-eternal beings? No. Is this a show, a theatrical performance? No. Is God really a father, or is he just pretending to be a father? Is this role playing like some Adventist-affiliated publications have claimed in the past? In recent times, we have theologians publicly making statements that they don't believe the Bible to be literal. They don't believe that the Father and the Son is a literal relationship, even though it is stated hundreds of times in the Bible. They say the Son of God is to be taken metaphorically or as a role that Jesus takes on. The definition of Jesus Christ taken on a role and not the literal Son of the Father is actually Antichrist according to the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verses 22-24 through 24 says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Tommy, one minute. I want to get that. So Tommy, so we're saying that if you believe in the Trinity, that is an Antichrist, yes, right? Yes. So how many Antichrists are there today? Oh, tons. So tons. we're some people are waiting for just one specific individual, right? So yes. anybody that believes in the Trinity, but it's not in the Bible, that would be against Christ, right? Yes. Or anti. So how many are in today? Billions, yeah. maybe. Right? Yes. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry to interrupt No, you. you're good. It is true that Christ existed in eternity, but the Bible says that he came out from God, proceeded forth, and came from God, came out from thee, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting, set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was, I was brought forth. And this is in John chapter 8, verse 42, chapter 16, verse 20, uh, chapter 17, verse 8, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and through uh, 24. Did the Father really have a literal son? Yes. Can you be drawn to him if you cannot see the manifestation of the Father's love? No. If we don't believe, we make him a liar if we don't believe that he gave his literal son. John chapter 17 verse 3 says, And this is life eternal, that you might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus spoke these words to his Father, and it was the Father that sent Jesus Christ to us. To know the only true God is the only way that man can be elevated through the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the most important thing in making us like God in character. This is life eternal. Yet so many people are told by their pastors or leaders that God is a mystery, Tommy. This leads only to confusion and delusion and Babylonian doctrine, Tommy. Yep. The most reputable authorities agree that the part of 1 John 5, 7, and 8 was most certainly added to the Bible during the period known as the Dark Ages. And we have plenty of comments about that in study Bibles and historical statements. Some people would object strongly to the very suggestion that errors may have crept into the text of the Bible in any way whatsoever. Now we will address some troubling history pertaining to our key text topic, 1 John 5, 7. Let the following explain accordingly, as you will see there is an authentic text that was inspired by the Spirit of God to John. And then there was a spirit from another that was inspired translators to text in brackets. 
is text that were not found in the original manuscripts, but later added. So they wanted to get that Trinity in there, didn't they, or try to allude to it, but they couldn't overall because the Bible, the entire Bible overruled that. By the way, the Bible is a Judean Christian book. Uh, they didn't believe in three gods, never promoted three gods, and never will no. if you believe the Bible. So let's look at this. Verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Verse 8, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So the original text would read in the King James, for there are three that bear record, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. As you can see, this matches up well with all the other versions of the Bibles whose translators chose not to add the controversial text. They knew the historical addition to the text was an on guard not to use it. Other Bible versions confirm exactly what is being shown and illustrated here Compare them to the King James. And Tommy, I'm going to let you go through those because it's a very interesting study. So in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, in the New International Version, it says, For there are three that testify. And the New Living Translation says, So we have these three witnesses. The English Standard Version says, For there are three that testify. Berean Study Bible, For there are three that testify. New American Standard Bible, For there are three that testify. Holman Christian Standard Bible, for there are three that testify. International Standard Version, for there are three witnesses. First John chapter 5, verse 8, New International Version. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. New Living Translation. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. English Standard Version. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. Berean Study Bible. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. New American Standard Bible, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. International Standard Version, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. The Kama Johannium, also known as the Kama Johannine. I'm glad you had those words, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> Jo Johannine, okay, uh, is a textual variant in regards to 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. The word comma simply means short clause, and Johannium means pertaining to John. Without the comma, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 reads, For there are three that bear record, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay, with the comma, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8 reads, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. As many today teaching this comma Johannium, reading this by itself, you could make up all kinds of variations of doctrines. But as we have read previously, looking at the totality of the witness of Christ and the record that his Father gave, this is not teaching anything to do with a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as found in Trinity doctrines. None of the oldest Greek manuscripts of 1 John contain the comma. None of the very early church fathers included it when quoting or referencing 1 John 5, 7, and 8. The presence of the comma Johannium in the Greek manuscript is actually quite rare until the 15th century A.D. Imagine the 15th century. That is well over a thousand years later after Christ was on earth and the writings of the New Testament was recorded by Paul, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and John. It's primarily found in Latin manuscripts. While some of the Latin manuscripts containing the comma Johannium appear to be ancient, the comma Johannum did not appear in the original Latin Vulgate written by Jerome. In the 16th century, when Desertius Armarius was compiling what became known as the Tectus Recepticus, he did not include the comma Johannian in the first or second editions. Due to intense pressure from the Catholic Church and others who wanted it included because of its support for Trinitarianism, wow, Amarius included the comma Johannine in later editions of the Textus Recepticus. His decision resulted in the comma Johannine being included in the King James Version of the Bible 
and later in the New King James Version. None of the modern Greek texts, Nestle's, Alad, and majority texts, contain the comma Johannum. Of all the modern English translations, only the New King James Version and the modern English Version include the comma Johannum. While it would be convenient for there to be an explicit statement confirming some kind of a Trinity doctrine in the Bible, but the comma Johannum was not originally part of 1 John. Some scribe either intentionally or accidentally added it to a Latin manuscript, and then that edition was copied thousands upon thousands of times. Latin manuscripts came way after the original Greek writings of the New Testament. This eventually resulted in the comma Johannium appearing in the vast majority of Latin manuscripts. Whatever the scribe's motives, whether intentionally or by accident, it is absolutely wrong to add to God's word. The comma Johannum is not a god brief statement nor a writing from the Apostle John and does not belong in the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity is taught and applied from using the human construction and man-made additions to many other biblical passages. If God thought an explicit mention of him being a part of a Trinity God was necessary, he himself would have made sure it was very clear in his word with the weight of evidence, Tommy. The textual evidence is against 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, explains Dr. Neil Lightfoot, a New Testament professor. Of all the Greek manuscripts, only two contain it. These two manuscripts are of very late dates, one from the 14th or 15th century and the other from the 16th century. Two other manuscripts have this verse written in the margin. All four manuscripts show that this verse was apparently translated from a late form of the Latin Vulgate. And this is how we got the Bible, 2003, pages uh, 100 and 101. Theology professor Anthony and Richard Hansen, in their book Reasonable Belief, a survey of Christian faith explained the unwarranted addition to the text this way. It was added by some enterprising person or persons in the ancient church who felt that the New Testament was sadly deficient in direct witness to the kind doctrine of the Trinity, which he favored and who determined to remedy that defect. It is a waste of time to attempt to read Trinitarian doctrine directly off the pages of the New Testament. This is in 1980, page 171. Pete's commentary on the Bible is very incisive in its comments as well. The famous interpolation after three witnesses is not printed in RSV, and rightly so. No respectable Greek manuscript contains it. Appearing first in the late 4th century Latin text, it entered the Vulgate, the 5th century Latin version, which became the common medieval translation. And finally, the New Testament of Erasmus, who produced newly collated Greek texts and a new Latin version in the 16th century. And this is uh, page 1038. Man, that's a big book. The Expositor's uh, Bible Commentary also dismisses the King James and New King James Version's editions in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. As obviously a late gloss with no merit. And this is Glenn Barker, volume 12, 1981, page 353. The big book of Bible difficulties tell us this verse has virtually no support among the early Greek manuscripts. Its appearance in the late Greek manuscripts is based on the fact that Aramis was placed under ecological pressure to include it in his Greek New Testament of 1522. Having omitted it in his two earlier editions of 1516 and 1519 because he could not find any Greek manuscripts which contained it. Mm, that's Norman Geisler and Thomas Howe, 2008, page 540 and 541. As you can see in 1 John 5, has nothing to do with God being a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word Trinity did not come into common use as a religious term until after the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., Tommy. Paganism. Several centuries after the last books of the New Testament were complete, it is simply not a biblical concept. Surely hellfire awaits those who take one verse or even a few from the Bible and manipulate it for the use of a false doctrine brought in by man's fables placed on the mind of the unsuspecting soul who just wants to worship God honestly in spirit and in truth. 
But the result is that we're led astray by Satan's deceptions, falling for a strange God, yet thinking it's Jesus, Tommy. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Here are just a few references to touch lightly on on the history of the most pointed doctrine within all Christendom, and that is on the Trinity. To briefly summarize what was pertinent, we start with the mention of the famous Greek philosopher Plato. Anyone that's going to college out there, you should study that in college, Plato. And in 429 and 347 BC, he believed in a divine triad of a god, the ideas and the world spirit, though he nowhere explained or harmonized this triad. This is Charles Brigg, Christian Platonist of Alexandria, 1886, page 249. As Bible scholars John McClintock and James Strong explain, towards the end of the first century and during the second, many learned men came over from both from Judaism and paganism to Christianity. These brought with them into the Christian schools of theology their Platonic or Plato ideas and phraseology. Huh? This is a Cyclopedia of Biblical Theology and Ecclesiastical Literature, 1891, Volume 10, Trinity, page 553. The Alexandria Catechetical School, which revered Clement of Alexandria and Origen, the greatest theologian of the Greek Church as its head, applied the allegorical method to explanation of Scripture. Its thought was influenced by Plato. Its strong point was pagan theological speculations. Athanasius and the three Cappadocians, the men whose Trinitarian views were adopted by the Catholic Church at the Council of Nicaea in Constantinople, had been included among its members. Hubert Jeddon, Ecumenical Councils of the Catholic Church and Historical Outline, 1960, page 28. The doctrines of the Logos, or the Word, a designation for Christ in John 1, and the Trinity received their shape from the Greek fathers, who were much influenced directly or indirectly by the Platonic philosophy. The errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. The new chef Herzog, Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, Samuel McCulley, Jackson, Editor, 1911, Volume 9, page 91. The preface to the uh, historian Edward Gibbons' history and Christianity sums up the Greek influence on the adoption of the Trinity doctrine by stating, If paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism. The pure deism, basic religion in this context of the first Christians, was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. Many of the pagan tenets invented by the Egyptians and idealized by Plato, were retained as being worthy of belief. And this is 1883, page 16. See how ancient Trinitarian gods influenced adoption of the Trinity. Pretty thorough, Tommy. Yeah. Don't you think so? If you're worshiping a tritheism or fraud head, they want to call it Godhead, which is just talking about the divinity of the Father and the Son, divine. It's not talking about a Trinity. If you're worshiping a Trinity, you're really worshiping a pagan doctrine. We know that comes from Babylon. It's sun worship, and it's really devil worship. All the time while you're using Jesus' name. What a deception. You know, Tom, I want to read one more thing. That How does this work into the end times? You know, are we in the end of time, not the time of the end, but the end of time? Well, yeah. we got to be getting close. got to be getting close. Yeah. I mean, come on. Nancy Pelosi's eating a lot of ice cream out there, isn't she, Toby? And we're not date setters, but no. I mean, everyone, I mean, even people that don't really study prophecy, they're like, oh, I don't know how much God can take. And let me just read something out of the Bible, Tommy. And I want the radio listening audience, you know, or YouTube audience to listen to this. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Are these things taking place right now around you? Okay, it's in Second Epistles of Timothy, chapter 3, and I'm going to start with verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boisterous, proud, 
blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Now notice number three, without natural affection. Mm, it's interesting. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Verse four, traitors, heady, high-minded, look, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, this is really gets me, verse five. You know, we could say, well, that's from the world, right, Tommy? That yeah. fits the world perfectly, doesn't it, Tommy? Yeah, or that's been going on for a long right. time, yeah. Well, this is talking about Christians. Yep. Verse five says, having a form of godliness. In other words, a Trinitarian godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Now listen what this sort does. For this sort they are which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers lust. Mm, boy, I'd love to get into that one. Just dig into that one. We might step on some toes there. And number seven, and I'm going to stop. It says, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Tommy, have you ever been into Bible studies and they'll just endlessly Bible study, but there's no point to the study. Yeah, and they just want to do chapter by chapter, and they don't even let Scripture interpret itself or anything. No, so you could be ever learning, right? Oh, I've learned, and I, I've asked individuals, I said, well, what did you learn? Well, I don't know, but we had a Bible study. They memorize verses, and they don't know what the verses mean. mean. And, and we're not saying this to be, uh, you know, like spiritually proud or mocking or anything like that. It's actually really heartbreaking to us. Well, it's heartbreaking to the point because when you do get somebody that comes in and wants to let Scripture interpret itself on a specific subject, they won't let you talk. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and once you start to show that the pastor's preaching, you know, false doctrine, then it's you're, you're a heretic and they uh, kick you out of the church. Yeah, or building, you know, building, because remember, truth is not popular, never will be popular, wasn't popular in Jesus' time, never has been popular in all the New Testament, and it's still not popular today, but that doesn't mean we can't preach it, does it, Tommy? No, no. Now, I want to end with verse 12 and 13, same chapter 3, second epistle of Timothy, verse 12 and 13. Yea, that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Hmm. And it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It didn't say that they would be getting better and better. Worse and worse. Now notice what they're doing. Deceiving and being deceived. Is the doctrine of the Trinity deception? Yes. Is the fraud head or false godhead, is that deception? Yes. And are they deceiving people? Yes. So is that coming true today? Yes. And it's always been true. So there are how many antichrist? Many. Many. Don't worry about waiting for one, Todd. There's, there's so many out there you could count them. There's many antichrists that are preaching to you another Jesus, right, Tom? Yes. And here's another thing when it says that that many the the wax cold. Well, that's because people in the end were going they're going to be showing them that the Trinity's false doctrine, and they're going to be showing them from the Bible where the Trinity's false, and they're going to reject it. And if you start doubting the Bible, you're doubting God, just like Eve did whenever God said that if you eat of this fruit, you'll die, and Satan said, you won't die. So when Eve started doubting God, that's whenever she she was tempted and sinned. Okay, well, in the end, whenever everyone's trying to show everybody that the Trinity's false doctrine and people keep rejecting that truth, God's going to allow them to believe a lie, and then their, their love is going to be waxed cold. So you would be really blasphemy against God's Spirit. Yes. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is His Spirit. One more thing, Tommy, I want to add a great point. It said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge in quick and of the dead of His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Notice what it says here. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, 
They shall heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. So are people heaping together teachers that promote the Trinity? Yes. Yes. Do they want sound doctrine? No. No. Is that happening today? Oh, yeah, all over. Yeah. So, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. In other words, we're telling you the truth here. You can turn it off. You're fulfilling prophecy in the Bible. Or you can follow it. And they shall be turned into fables. What is the Trinity? It's a... It's a fable. It's a fable. But notice what it says to us. But watch thou in all things, endure inflictions, because you're going to get inflictions when you start breathing truth. Now, if you don't, you'll have that smoothie religion. Smoothie. And you'll have a large following in a big house. Yeah, big house, and you'll have that. You could possibly have a, a car in the swimming pool, you know, on there, and, and many different. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're not going to pre-preaching truth. You'll be held accountable for that, I'm just telling you, through Jesus. It says, but watch thou in all things endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of the ministry. And that's what I challenge all of us, including us here. Let's make full proof of that ministry and get truth out here. Because whether we're talking about it or not, this truth is going on. Yeah, and it's, the truth is that Jesus is literally the Son. I mean, it's sad that the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God so many times that now we have to start being specific and telling people like, no, he's literally the son of God. He's not a metaphor. So verse eight, henceforth, there's laid up for us, I put me here for us, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge shall give us at that day. That day hasn't happened yet, has it, Tommy? It's coming yep. though. Yep. Okay. And not to me and Tommy only, but to, to all them that also love is appearing. And by the way, there are going to be a lot of people, might, you know, hopefully it won't be any of us, that are not going to love his appearing because they've made their kingdom on this earth. Remember, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't take any offerings and start building $50 million mansions while people were starving outside, did he, Tommy? No, or a $28 million church. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. God bless him. So we hope that you'll come closer to Christ, that you'll uh, share this booklet with your pastors. You'll start having Bible studies in home. This book will be on the page and to, to be downloaded and to start studying the Word of God to lead you closer to the Son, to the Father. Amen? Yes. Okay, Tommy. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, like Randy said, I'll put the uh, PDF of this book in the uh, description below. And yeah, um, please share it. Please ask questions and please give us any new information you have. And uh, if you have any more information on the first John 5, 7, I know a lot of people say that the Catholic Church actually admitted to putting this into the Bible. Uh, I've done a little bit of study on it, and I believe Randy has too. And uh, I mean, but if you want to leave it in there, that's fine. Because once you start telling people that it shouldn't be in there, then they're like, oh, well, you just want to take out verses to make you know your beliefs convenient. But no, we can leave it in there. And, and at the beginning of this <coughs> booklet, it does leave it in there. But it also shows that it's not talking about a three-headed God. No. So the context of First John chapter yes. five and four, in the context of all of John's writings, yeah. is that Jesus is literally the Son of God, and that He had a Father. Yeah. All of His writings. Yes. He never promoted a Trinity. No. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Take care, and God bless. God bless.